The Arab expansion after the passing of Mohammed in 632 led in a matter of 80 or 90 years to the building of, of the huge Arab empire from Spain on the west to Pakistan on the east. And the, the first century, more or less, uh, was ruled by the Umayyad dynasty. In 750, the Umayyads were overthrown by the Abbas family, and they established the Abbasid Empire. It ruled the Middle East from 750, basically, to 1250. And those 500 years were a golden age for the Arab world, the Muslim world. Um, the center was Baghdad. The, the House of Learning established in Baghdad became a major research and learning institution. The Greek classics were uh, translated into Arabic and began to be known to the world. Um, major breakthroughs were made in medicine, in mathematics, the zero was brought in from from India. We have the Arabic numeral system, which we still use today, uh, replaced the older, less functional uh, numeric systems, such as the one used by the Romans. So it, it brought in a major age of learning, science, and medicine. Norman Stillman says about this age, the Abbasid period in Baghdad. The establishment of the Abbasid capital in Iraq was to have profound consequences for all Jews of Arab lands. Iraq was ancient Babylon. It was already the foremost center of world Jewry two centuries before the Arab conquest. The Baghdadi Jewish community was one of the most important in the world, literally from the uh, late 800s to the 1950s. Jews made up one-third of the population of Baghdad, and they continued to have an important role in the city uh, literally into the 1950s when uh, the migration out of the, the, the country began and the pressure on Jews was to leave because of the rising anti-Semitism of the pan-Arab nationalist movement that we will be looking at later. Under Abbasid rule, coming out of Baghdad from the 700s into the 1200s, uh, they established a vast empire not only of learning, but of commerce, of communications, and it really became the center of, of world learning at that time. In the Abbasid dynasty, cultural pluralism was a hallmark of that period. Um, under the earlier um, Umayyad dynasty, it had been much more Arab-focused and Arab-controlled. Uh, but with the Abbasids, they, uh, they opened it up to a broader Muslim influences. Um, and there, there were people that were coming in uh, from many different parts of the empire. Going back to Norm Stillman again, he says of this time, Jewish culture itself developed and flourished during the Islamic High Middle Ages, from 850 to 1250. This was the period that saw the, the crystallization and formalization of Judaism as we know it today. During this time, the Babylonian Talmud gradually became the constitutional foundation of diaspora Judaism. The synagogue service and the prayer book text took on their familiar form. Jewish theology was systematized, Jewish law codified. The Hebrew language and literature underwent its greatest revival prior to its rebirth in modern times. The richest description that we have of Jewish life in Baghdad during this time comes from Benjamin de Tudela, Benjamin of Tudela. He was in Baghdad in 1168. He gives the description of the leader of the Jewish community visiting the Caliph. And he says this, every fifth day 
when the leader of the Jewish community goes to pay a visit to the great caliph, horsemen, Gentiles, as well as Jews, escort him, and heralds proclaim him in advance, marching ahead of him. And they shout, the heralds shout, Make way for our Lord, the son of David, as is due unto him. <clears throat> he is mounted on a horse and is attired in robes of silk and embroidery with a large turban on his head. And from the turban is suspended a long white cloth adorned with a chain upon which the cipher of Mohammed is engraved. There are 25 Jewish synagogues in Baghdad. And... Um, they are, have columns of marble in various colors overlaid with silver and gold. And on the columns are carved sentences of the Psalms in golden letters. In front of the ark, there are 10 steps of marble. And on the top step um, are the seats, uh, the, the seat where the head of the community sits, the princes of the house of David. So this is the description that Benjamin of Tudela gives of the Jewish community in Baghdad, uh, looking primarily at the leaders. We don't get a real description of the, the, the common life of Jewish families, but he's talking about the, the excellence of the leadership and the luxury uh, that they enjoy. <clears throat> The, the absent period is also the period that we know it coincides with the period that we know is the Gaonic Judaism. The term Gaon, again, uh, comes from the, the name for the head of one of the yeshivot, one of the important academies of Jewish learning and scholarship. And this was the time of the great Gaonim, uh, the, the, the heads of the academies. And... Uh, the person who is perhaps most important in this process is Sadia Gaon. Sadia Gaon seems to have been born in Egypt, <clears throat> but later he migrated into <clears throat> Israel and then on to Baghdad, where he eventually became the head of one of the large academies. Uh, he was the head of the, the, the academy Sura, which was considered the most important one. And he became the person who had such an important effect on shaping Judaism as we know it today. Um, I mentioned at one point earlier was the fact that he translated the Torah into Arabic, a translation that is still used today. Uh, his responsa, the, <clears throat> the responses to questions of law that came in, um, were important. Sadia Gaon was also a leader in establishing the idea that rationalism was consistent with religion. In his book, the philosophical work that he wrote, The Book of Beliefs and Opinions, which was written in Arabic, he postulated the idea that the rational basis of Jewish thought was consistent with the teachings of Aristotle and Plato. This was a radical shift from the traditions of previous Gaonim, who had limited themselves to the study of Talmud and Halakhic teachings. And with Sadia Gaon, we have this opening up to look at other philosophical traditions. In 1250, the Mongols invaded the Middle East and basically destroyed Baghdad. Uh, Iraq and Baghdad would never return to its place of eminence that it had enjoyed up to that time, 1250. The Abbasid Caliph abandoned uh, Baghdad and moved to Egypt, which was a safer region. Um, the, but the power of the Abbasids was broken at this point. Uh, they continued to be nominally the Caliph, the head of, of Islam, uh, but they never had the power again. They were eventually replaced by the Ottomans, the Ottoman Turks, who became the next leader, and they began emerging in the 1400s. Um, so we find the Muslim world governed by Ottomans 
from the 1450s then into the 1920s. So literally, it's under two major empires that most of the Middle East lived from the 700s into the 1900s. An amazing stretch of, of uh, powerful empires. One of the reasons I'm mentioning this is to say nationalism didn't exist during this time period. People looked at large governments from a distance and we don't really get the sense of peoplehood or nationalism until we get into the 1900s. Uh, but I would like to mention that during the Ottoman period, one of the people who stands out that we really should know about, Doña Gracia Nasi, who was of a Spanish family, expelled in 1492. They moved into Portugal. Um, she eventually married into another uh, Jewish family. Uh, they were all forcibly converted and became Anosim. Um, but uh, Doña Gracia and her family continued being crypto-Jews. And <clears throat> uh, her hus husband's family became quite wealthy through a royal monopoly. Um, he died early on, and she became the head of that family empire with ships and trading and so on. And she becomes a major figure of helping Jews trying to leave Portugal and Spain and return to the practice of Judaism. And she facilitated their moving to the Ottoman Empire. And with her help, we find the development of the Sephardic Jews of the eastern end of the Mediterranean in the, in the Ottoman Empire, in Greece, Turkey, uh, present-day Israel, and she's a major figure that is worth knowing about. Her nephew, Joseph Nasi, became an important consultant to the, to the Sultan of Turkey, and he was named the Duke of Naxos, a series of islands off the coast of Turkey. Um, Joseph Nasi was a major figure in fighting against Spanish shipping and fighting against Christendom uh, for the rest of his days. As a result, he'd er he learned he earned a reputation uh, in Europe of uh, a Jew helping the Muslims against the Christians. Shortly after Joseph Nasi died, Christopher Marlowe wrote *The Jew of Malta*, and it the it's it's about a Jew uh, who is a renegade uh, who works against Christendom, and it looks very much like the story of Joseph Nasi. The heartland of Arab life is Saudi Arabia, the Arabian Peninsula, and it's known as a more austere, traditional kind of Arab life. Um, once we get to Egypt and we start that track across North Africa, uh, we find that uh, Arab life and Muslim life uh, takes on other characteristics. So North Africa has a little bit of a different tradition. It's a part of the Arab world, but it's one that uh, is more Mediterranean, uh, has more contact with Europe, and it's, it's a different aspect of the Arab world. We'll be looking at Jewish life there and uh, seeing it in this context. The conflict between Islamicists and moderates in the Arab world runs deep. Uh, Islamists are usually more austere and expect a more traditional lifestyle. Uh, moderates in the Arab world are more willing to be in contact with Europe, to wear European style clothing, and to speak European languages. So this becomes an important part of how the Jewish life interacts um, in the Arab world with these differences. We'll be looking to a certain extent at Jews in Morocco. Um, it's where I have more experience. It's where the largest Jewish population still exists in North Africa. The only, well, there's a small one in Tunisia, uh, but it's, it's 
one of the last populations in North Africa and in the Arab world. One of the things that we find here is um, that a life is more, uh, has more contact with Europe. It's also quite common in, in Casablanca today to see walking down the street um, the, the, the grandmother wearing a jalaba, completely covered, uh, the mother wearing modest Western-style dress, but dressed Western, and the granddaughter wearing designer sunglasses, high boots, um, and, and very uh, also designer fashions, um, but with a headscarf. So you can, you can find uh, these kind of transitions going on in the Muslim world today. And it's in this context that the Jewish community lives. The Jewish population in Morocco is one of the oldest Jewish populations in the world. Um, the first people that arrived there, it's believed, came with the fall of the first temple. And there was a migration, it seems, across North Africa, uh, arriving into the Maghreb, there was no Morocco at that time, but uh, arriving into the Maghreb at the Atlas Mountains. <clears throat> and those early Jewish immigrants somehow fused with the Berber, the Amasig tribes that, that were there, the indigenous tribes. And some of the Amasigs, some of the Berbers became Jewish, uh, whether they were totally Jewish to start with and just adapted Amasig lifestyle or whether Berbers, the Amasig, converted, uh, we don't know for sure, but somehow in that process Jews arrived and then later we find complete Amasig Jewish tribes there. And today in Casablanca there are still Berber Jews, Amasig Jews. Uh, the Jewish life in Morocco has always been, has long been linked with um, Spain, with the Iberian Peninsula, and it's the Andalusian exchange, the Andalusian corridor, um, where Muslims and Jews from Morocco have moved into Spain. And when Christian Spain expelled the Jews, many of them moved back into Morocco. Uh, so in Morocco, you started getting this fusion between people who were of Spanish Jewish descent and the Arab Amasig. Moroccans who had always lived there. And Morocco gives this particular combination of these traditions coming together. Uh, you can still find in Morocco today, in the northern cities where there are Jewish populations left, um, people speaking Spanish. And But as you move further south, you start hearing more Arabic. And the tradition in the Spanish begins to be lost. Uh, in the northern part of Morocco, you can hear Judeo-Spanish dialect being spoken. The southern part of Morocco, you can hear Judeo-Arabic dialects being spoken. Um, so you find these coming together of traditions. One of the traditions coming out of the Amasig culture, which has become an important part of Jewish Morocco, is reverence for the Sadiqim, the Sadiqs, the especially holy rabbis, are religious scholars who are held in reverence. And across their dozens, even into the hundreds, there are grave sites of Sadiqim across Morocco. Uh, there are a few that are particularly important. These grave sites are usually maintain, maintained by local Muslim families. And Muslims also go to them to pray, uh, to ask for healing, uh, to ask for special things that the Sadi might be able to help them with. Um, and we, as a part of this segment, we will see um, a, a, uh, the prayers that are sung around the grave of a Sadiq. Uh, this will be in Wasan, and you'll see a little bit more about that in the video accompanying this. At the, at the yard side of a Sadiq, Hundreds and even thousands of people can gather at the gravesite of one of the most important ones. Um, people come internationally from Israel, from France, from the United States to visit the gravesite of, of these important Sadiqim. 
One of the important ones is Rabbi Amram ben Duan, and his grave is in Wasan, in Morocco, central Morocco. Um, he came here from Israel in the 1700s, uh, actually set up a yeshiva, became quite famous for teaching, and, uh, the, and stories also began to emerge about his ability to heal people. And that became a part of the legend surrounding this site. His yard site um, is attended by large numbers of people today, and it can go on for several days. Um, and they're, they're singing, there are services, they're socializing, uh, uh, communal meals, uh, and it becomes a, a major enterprise. <laughs> In an interesting um, change from the, the usual sadikim, the, the one that is most revered in Morocco is a woman, Sulika. Her tomb is in Fez, in the Jewish cemetery in Fez. She was, of course, not a rabbi, um, but she's highly revered because she represents the story of preserving Jewish life. Um, there, there are several stories about Sulika. Um, she was actually a young woman in the 1800s. Uh, the basic story says um, that one of the local um, Muslim leaders in Tangier, where she lived, uh, saw her and saw how beautiful she was as a young woman, uh, wanted to marry her. Somewhere in the process, uh, she wound up in Fez, where the sultan lived. Um, the sultan wanted to marry her. But to become the wife of the sultan, she would have to cons convert to Islam. And according to this version of the narrative, uh, she said, no, I cannot convert to Islam. I am Jewish and I will protect my Judaism. According to the story, uh, the sultan uh, said, you know, you either convert and become my wife or I will have your head taken off you'll be killed. Uh, she chose death rather than conversion, and she was beheaded and then buried in the Jewish cemetery there in Fez. Her tomb today is the most frequented one in the cemetery there. It's a large tomb. Uh, one of the practices uh, in, in Morocco is to light candles at the tomb of a beloved one or of a sadiq or one that you want to pay special attention to. And the tomb of Sulika is blackened from the candles that are lighted there for her and asking help from her. Um, the, and the other Hilula, the Hilula, the pilgrimage to the tombs of the sadiqs, you will also find the practice of burning candles um, in Wazan in the, the, the gravesite of Rabbi Amram bin Diwan, uh, the, the gravesite is blackened from the hundreds and thousands of candles that are burned on his grave there. So Sulika, the reason she became so important, um, the interpretation is, um, Vanessa Ploma Elbaz, her interpretation is that Sulika represents the, the courage to maintain Judaism in the face of the pressures to convert. And it's particularly important for women because women are the heart of Judaism. It's the children of a Jewish woman who are Jewish. So if, if a Jewish young woman converts to Islam, she's lost to the Jewish community and her children are lost to the Jewish community. 
So Sulika becomes the example of the importance of the woman in preserving the Jewish tradition. With the rise of nationalism in the mid 20th century and the establishment of Israel in 1948, the pressure on Jews living in Arab lands began to grow. There was more persecution. Nasser uh, was really behind the pan-Arab nationalism movement and included in that was anti-Semitism. This affected most of the countries of the Arab lands. And we find in Morocco, uh, it was at, at that time, Morocco had a Jewish population of perhaps 300,000 people. Uh, the exact number is not known, but it's in hundreds of thousands. And of course, many of the people wanted to go to Israel once it was established. Um, and Israel wanted to recruit Jews from the Muslim world. So there was active recruitment going on. Um, by people to encourage Jews to leave Morocco, to go to Israel. But at the same time, Arab nationalism was, was on the upswing, and Morocco was fighting for its independence from France. So by 1956-57, we find Morocco gaining its independence, and Jews had been favored by the French. Uh, Jews had important bureaucratic positions in the French colonial government. Um, so there was opposition to, to Jews and, and attacks on Jewish communities. Uh, that led to even more Jews leaving Morocco. These pressures continued uh, into the 1960s. And uh, what we find is that the Jewish community in Morocco gradually um, began leaving. And we find hundreds of thousands literally going to Israel. Um, other people, more wealthy families, moved to, to France. Uh, France, they were French speakers. And um, some moved to Montreal and, and, and to the Americas. Uh, but the largest number went to Israel. And in the process, the population declined dramatically going from hundreds of thousands of Jews in every town in Morocco, with synagogues in every town, down to only two or 3,000 Jews left today, mostly in Casablanca, uh, one of the things that happened was there were hundreds of synagogues abandoned. And in many cases, Judaica. Uh, as Jews were leaving, they took the Torah scrolls with them, uh, but we still find the, the Bima uh, and other aspects of uh, Jewish life left in the synagogues. We know Raphael El Malik, who was a uh, person who later, when the Jewish um, Museum was established in Casablanca, Raphael had the job of going out and visiting these abandoned synagogues and seeing what could be collected for the, the Jewish Museum in Casablanca. Uh, Rafi tells a story that in one of the villages he arrived, and this was uh, 40 years after the Jews had left, um, the local Muslim caretaker of the synagogue there um, still had the key for the synagogue. When Rafi arrived, uh, the, 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 this Muslim caretaker said, you know, when the Jews left our town, they told me that a Jew would be coming in the future to find out about the synagogue, and they asked for me to take care of it. He had taken care of it for all of those decades, and he said, I waited all this time, and now you finally arrived. The, 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 the older Muslims in Morocco have favorable memories of their Jewish neighbors and business partners uh, that they worked with for so many years. Um, what we find, though, is the younger generation of Moroccans have no experience knowing Jews. And um, many times, younger uh, Moroccans ask the question, why did the Jews leave? 
they don't know the history 40 and 50 and 60 years ago. Um, so you, you find that kind of dynamic going on between the generations. The younger generation is tends to be more anti-Semitic, uh, less tolerant of Jews, and basically because they don't know any Jews. Jews who live in Arabic lands, speak Arabic, live an Arabic lifestyle, will say to you that they are Arab Jews. And one of the things we find is that the family organization does look quite similar to the family organization of Arab Muslims. It's an Arab community. Um, you find a separation between men and women. Um, the, the location for men is the synagogue. The spiritual location for women is the home. In the synagogue, uh, women do not go to the bima, do not read the Torah. Although I have seen women sitting in the balcony overlooking men reading the Torah, and if a man would make a mistake reading it, I have heard women correct the man reading the Torah. So you can have, uh, that was in a Sephardic uh, synagogue, by the way, in, in Morocco. Uh, so you do have these kind of instances. Uh, women, uh, in this context, from my discussions with them, say that there is a separation between men and women and a separation between home and the synagogue. Both are Jewish spaces. Uh, the synagogue is a space for men. They should go there and pray. Men have a special requirement for praying. They, but women have the requirement for keeping the family Jewish and keeping the religious traditions in the family. So you have this interesting separation where men are responsible for public prayer, but women are responsible for keeping the family Jewish. So women um, keep the, the house kosher. Uh, that's an important part of observance. Women make sure that uh, Shabbat is observed. Women start the Shabbat by lighting candles and welcoming, welcoming in the Shahina. Women end the Shabbat with their husband, in this case, doing Havdalah. And so the, the women circumscribe Shabbat and the Kashrut of the family. Women make sure that the children are taught Judaism. So even though men are praying in the synagogue, but it's the woman who keeps the Jewish character of the family. And, and as it's been described to me, people see these as parallel functions. Uh, it's not that the men are more religious, uh, but they just have a different religious responsibility. Women see their responsibility as being equally important, if not more important, than that of the men. In the gendered world of Jewish Arab life, the male and the female sectors of society are separate. Um, and we also find that the, the cultural practices are different in some ways, particularly in music. We find a very interesting separation. And again, I'm drawing here from the, the work of Vanessa Paloma Elbaz, and she is the first person I know that has recognized and described this difference. Uh, what she found was that the liturgical uh, uh, music sung by men in the synagogue uses tunes that the women also use. 
So they share the tunes, but men are singing liturgical mu music in the synagogue. Women use those tunes to sing women's songs in family gatherings, in ceremonies, in, in, in the household environment. And the women's songs are ballads. They are songs about life about the husband and the wife, about a husband being gone, about a child being missing, or a child being kidnapped, um, about um, fidelity in the marriage, um, other issues of that type. Uh, so in this, this gendered world, the separation of men and women's world, we find it not only in prayer and in religious practice, but we also find it here in music in a very interesting way. In the synagogue, on the floor with the bima, where the men sit, and where the, uh, the ark is with the Torah scrolls, um, we, we find it tends to be a stylized process. Men sit in certain places according to social status. The president of the synagogue sits in, immediately in front of the bima. The bima is located in the center of the synagogue, the ark in the front and leading members of the synagogue sit between the bima and the ark. Um, the service is carried out by singing, and it's, it's not led by a cantor. Uh, the men in the synagogue itself sing. So you will find one man starting the singing process at the beginning of the Shaharit service, for example. Uh, he will sing a, a piyot, uh, then another man, he finishes that, another man will pick up the next one and sing that one, then a third one will pick it up and sing another one, and you find this rotation of singing, and then people will come together and sing in common. Um, it is such a beautiful ceremony, uh, a beautiful prayer service. Um, when the time for the Torah service comes, it's, it's not the rabbi who reads the Torah, the rabbi is sitting in the back, uh, or sitting on the bima, on the back part of the bima. Um, the various people are called up to read the Torah. In the Jewish life in an Arab land, there are traditions preserved that are, are unique. One of them is the protection of the vulnerable. Uh, you might be familiar with seeing the hamsa, the, the hand, uh, which is used as, a, uh, as an amulet, as a protective um, element to protect people from spirits that would wish you harm. And one of the, the things that's important, before a child is circumcised, um, on, on the seven days after the birth, the, there is a special ceremony to protect that child as he goes through circumcision the next day. So the night before, this is called the tadid. Uh, the Tadid is called the, the sword ceremony. And various of the, uh, this is a ceremony with, with all the family present, men and women. Uh, but some of the elders of the community are asked to come in with their swords. And they have ceremonial swords for this occasion. Uh, so the, the men will come in with their swords. And as they're singing hymns of protection, starting in Hebrew to start with, uh, for the child, they will go around and touch the swords on the four walls of the room where they are, using the swords to block off or to cut out any evil influence or any harm that can come to the child. And after the, that basic ceremony is, is concluded, the swords are then placed under the mattress where the child is sleeping to keep the child safe all that night and into the next day. As the singing goes on, it starts in Hebrew, as I mentioned, um, but the ones I've observed, as it progresses, uh, the singing will begin to shift into Judeo-Arabic, and it will end with Judeo-Arabic Jewish songs. The circumcision is a major ceremony in the community. Uh, people are invited according to what the family can, can afford, 
uh, the family invi uh, family invites not only the their larger extended family, um, but as much of the community that, as they can. It becomes a major community event, and the there's socializing, there's food, um, and the actual process of the circumcision itself. At which time the name the child's name is given, and you will see in some of the filmed sequences. Uh, how this actually looks like in a contemporary circumcision in Casablanca today. <laughs> The Jewish community of Casablanca is a complex community of 2,500 people with many neighborhood-based synagogues. Its religious, social, and cultural traditions and its vibrant life focused around the family and the community are deeply rooted in Morocco and the culture of the country. The Jews of Casablanca have created a special niche for themselves in this fabled city. This gives you something of an idea of what Jewish life is today in an Arab land, and perhaps that's a window into what Jewish life was in Arab lands uh, up until the last 70 years or so. We begin the transition now to Israel, um, Jews were emptied out of the Arab lands starting 70 years ago with the, the establishment of the State of Israel. In the late 1940s, there were 800,000 or more Jews living in Arab lands from Morocco across North Africa to Iraq. Today, there are only a few thousand Jews left in Arab lands. As we mentioned, the primary, the largest one is Morocco, which is two or three thousand people. There are a few hundred people left in, in Tunisia, um, but uh, that's about it in the Arab world. So the life shifts to Israel, and we'll find that Israel is much more of a Middle Eastern Arab country than we might think of it as being. And... In the next segments, we will begin to look at Jewish life in an Arab context in Israel and the relationship of Israel with its Arab neighbors. <laughs>